Zwerf, the European Money and Finance Forum, bringing together policymakers, finance, and academia. Welcome to this Zwerf, Buffy Bocconi, Austrian Central Bank workshop on how to raise R star. There is consensus among the economics profession that R star, the equilibrium rate of interest at which inflation is stable, has strongly declined over past decades, more so in Europe than in the US. While RSTAR in itself is not a policy goal, its currently estimated low level is widely perceived to pose several challenges, including eroding policy space for monetary policy, lower returns for savers and institutional investors, as well as banks, and potential negative consequences for resource allocation and productivity. So how reliable is our diagnosis of a low R star? Is this uncomfortable situation here to stay? What can be done to exit from this low R star trap? What are the interactions of economic policies with R star? What role might even monetary policy besides structural and fiscal policies have? We have gathered an impressive lineup of eminent speakers to share their analysis on these questions with us today. Robert Holtzman, governor of the Austrian Central Bank, is going to open with a keynote uh, lecture on raising our star, why, how, and if not now, when. Then, in the first session, Jakob de Haan from the University of Groningen and Swerf's president will moderate uh, the session with Claudio Borio from the BIS and also Swerf fellow giving a keynote lecture on navigating by our star safe or hazardous. Then Maria Valderrama from the Austrian Central Bank, Isabel van Stinkiste from the ECB and also member of the Swerfs Council of Management and Hiroshi Ugai, Economic Research Japan from JP Morgan will present various aspects concerning macroeconomic policies and our star, the theory of, and empirics of endogeneity and policy implications. Without further ado, I hand over to Governor Holtzmann. Thank you very much, sir, Ernest. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me warmly welcome you to this workshop on how to raise our star. It's a great pleasure to see Swerfer, Bocconi University, and Austin Central Bank have joined forces in bringing together such a fabulous group of experts to discuss this, I think, important and urgent topic. Falling a star, what is the problem? What can we really know? Well, the unobservable equilibrium interest rate called in central bank circles and academia star has been in decline across advanced economies over the last 30 plus years. This decline is typically linked to declining productivity, population aging, and an overhand of savings through investment. The fall in the estimated are star towards or below zero, together with very low inflation rates across much of the developed world, has brought uh, policy rates close to the effective lower bound. Beyond that, uh, it has led to the introduction of unconventional monetary policy measures. The use of these instruments was heavily accentuated with the economic fall out of the COVID crisis. Without the reversal of the trend in our star, the policy space for central banks will remain limited and economic perspectives dim. Central banks might have to extend current or implement new unconventional monetary policy instruments. While some argue this is no problem because fiscal policy may step in and uh, higher public debt is sustainable as long as the interest rates remain low, this route is not promising uh, for several reasons. First, if inflation were to rise eventually, central banks would have to tighten policy, thus potentially provoking sovereign debt crisis. This may question the credibility of their ability to indeed uh, safeguard price stability. A second equally important reason why a reversal of the falling R star trend is urgent is that the underlying reasons themselves are a matter of concern since they cast a shadow on future living standards. 
Let me briefly touch upon three issues which will be taken up in much more detail later on by this impressive workshop participants. First, how much do we really know about our star and its drivers? Second, which policies should foremost be taken to raise our star? Third, what is the relationship between our star and monetary policy? Can our star be regarded as a sound benchmark for interest rate setting? Let me move to the first topic, what to really know about our star and its drivers. Concerning the first issue, analytically, it is not clear what the main drivers of our star are. The empirical link of estimated our star and uh, uh, its strength of uh, its main possible drivers remains weak, as uh, Claudia Pori has elegantly shown in several publications. Uh, one of the conjectures drivers of our star increase in excess saving stems largely from equilibrium condition of optimal consumption allocation, so a la Ramsey equation, mixed with uh, partial equilibrium consideration, such as the demographic fallout of population aging. Furthermore, our knowledge of how to increase productivity remains limited, as well as the policy instruments available. The same applies to the demographic fallout of population aging, albeit I have more analytic confidence and policy vision in this area where I have worked uh, for many decades. An issue which is just coming uh, to the fore is the question how climate change will affect our star. Many would contend uh, that due to sunk capital, bad harvest, etc., climate change might further dampen our star. Indeed, recent reports uh, point to dramatic economic costs uh, in terms of lost GDP and lower productivity from insufficient climate protection action. But also climate protection in the transition that may be viewed as a negative supply shock, thus lowering our star temporarily. At the same time, also an opposite argument could be made in the sense that huge investment needed for climate protection will soak up savings, thus potentially tilting the saving investment balance towards a shortage of savings. I'm curious uh, what the views of this will be from this workshop. Let me move to the second part then. What policy should foremost be taken to raise our star? One of the motivation of the launch of ECP's monetary policy strategy back in 2020 was exactly to adjust our strategy to a lower level of our star compared to the situation we had in 2003, the last time we reviewed the strategy. Thus, much of the workshop done in some of the work streams was devoted to exploring the implications of a lower R star for monetary policy, both in the past and the future. For these reasons, we have invited your system economists that participated actively in the strategy review to share the insights with us. I look forward to hearing and discussing with those that analyze the effects of climate change digitalization and the globalization of growth, potential output on productivity and our star myself. There are two further important aspects, and again, we have invited prominent economists to discuss both. First, what about the monetary and uh, fiscal policy mix of raising our star? Second, what policies should be taken uh, to account, counteract the negative effects of population aging. Fiscal and uh, monetary policy interactions, as well as the implications from and for a star, were extensively discussed and analyzed not only during the monetary policy strategy review, but also during the COVID crisis. It is clear that in many cases, fiscal policy is better equipped that monetary policy at stimulating growth and productivity. The problem is that uh, in countries with the largest need for fiscal space may also be constrained the most. Let me connect this aspect with one of the drivers of our star, the disequilibrium in the saving investment relation. Some argue that to save 
asset scarcity could be solved by governments or by who's issuing, issuing more money and more debt. In my view, this could be self-defeating when higher debt ratios threaten debt sustainability. The problem has to be solved by channeling excessive saving to more productive investment while increasing the demand for savings by stimulating investment. This would also contribute to the increasing saving supply of saving assets if debt ratios fell and fiscal positions were improved. I'm convinced that ultra loose monetary policy is not the best tool to achieve this. Fiscal and structural policies are better equipped to stimulate investment in productivity enhancing technology. That means fiscal policy can contribute to increasing the level of human capital, which could facilitate diffusion and adoption of new technologies, therefore boosting uh, productivity. Second, let me share with you what I think what should be done to address population aging. And aging population dampens our stars through several channels. While an increase in savings for retirement depresses our star, a smaller labor force decreases productivity by decreasing the marginal return on capital. Also, the hump-shaped productivity profile of individuals leads in the aggregate to lower productivity as elderly get more numerous, and this may have accentuated the claimed negative effects of rising income equality on a star. Last but not least, as population aging is not only driven by higher life expectancy, but also lower fertility rates in industrialized countries, the resulting lower labor force growth directly affects a star simply by the Samuelson natural rate of interest effect. In contrast, a higher dependency ratio decreases the saving ratio and should thus have an opposite effect on a star, as argued by Charles Goodhart, who is also on this panel. So far, however, this last possible positive effect on a star has been more than compensated by the negative effects. Fortunately, there are some steps to be taken to solve uh, some of these problems. First, there's an urgent need to increase the retirement age. This would not only increase the labor force level and growth during the initial catch-up phase, but also permanently if retirement age were to be indexed uh, uh, to the longevity process. This measure would also reduce the fiscal burden for basic go pension system and decrease the need to save for retirement. Furthermore, we should also implement policies aimed at increasing labor force participation, for example, encouraging higher labor force participation of women and marginalized groups. Let me turn now to the third part, the relationships between ASTAR and monetary policy. And there, uh, let me to uh, outline the simple decision tree of which the graph you find there in the process posted uh, paper. Uh, in this decision tree, uh, let me distinguish three cases, uh, and the three cases are case one, a star is exogenous with, guest, uh, with, uh, with respect to monetary policy. In this case, monetary policy can do nothing about the star. As a corollary, there's also no risk that monetary policy would do anything undesirable to a star. It is for other policies, as described above, to take the necessary measures. So much for the bad news. The good news is, first, central banks can use more suasion to convince governments to take needed action uh, of unpleasant structural uh, reform measures. An event like today's falls in this category. The second good news would be that we could use a star as a reliable guidepost for monetary policy setting. So our life as central bankers could be fairly simple. We might more or less pursue a simple rule uh, or bite the effective lower bound of interest rates and the use of non-conventional instruments has made such a rule far from simple in practice. Uh, 
and uh, bring central banking again uh, more towards uh, art and uh, science. However, even if the complication of non-conventional instruments were not here, it is doubtful that uh, central bankers' life is really so simple. There are good reasons to hypothesize that a star actually is endogenous with respect to monetary policy. In other words, monetary policy itself affects a star. And see again, there are two cases, a benign one and then unpleasant one. Let me start with the benign one. A star is endogenous with respect to monetary policy and expansionary monetary policy also encourages productive investment, R&D, and generates human capital. Thus, beside its short run effect, Expansionary monetary policy also raises long-term productivity growth and potential output. This use goes in the same direction as the Keynesian hysteresis argument by supporting growth employment firms in the short run. Monetary policy would prevent long-term damage to the economy and might in the extreme even support long-term productivity growth and thus hasta. This unfolding of events would be really welcome, but is it likely? We don't know. And indeed, one should at least raise serious doubts about it. In fact, also monetary policy has been highly accommodative in many years now. We have not seen an increase in inflation, nor in productivity, and estimates of our star remain close or below zero. Besides the new area, the example is even more telling, and uh, we are happy that we have an expert on Japanese experience with, here, with us today. If the positive effect dominates and we increase our star with an accommodative monetary policy, we could still use our star as a guidepost since the errors we would make uh, would be beneficial. Over time, our star would increase, and therefore we would gain policy space. We choose also facilitate exit from the low interest rate environment. There are three possible explanations for the persistency of low inflation and productivity growth. First, we either are confronted constantly with negative shocks and find ourselves in a low growth regime from which we are not able to leave. Second, monetary policy uh, might not be as accommodative as we think. This would simply imply that we are mismeasuring the output gap or a star itself. The third possible explanation leads me to case 2B in my decision tree. It is the case that expansionary monetary policy, particularly if it were highly expansionary and for a very long period, would encourage unproductive investment, keep unproductive firms alive, bind capital and labor in these activities and keep them from seeking more profitable activities uh, it is doing their Jupiterian uh, uh, creative destruction. If this were the case, then such expansionary money policy in the long run depresses our star even further and uh, leads to a vicious circle of lower productivity growth, ever lower star, and more expansionary and conventional monetary policy, seeking to stimulate aggregate demand by pushing interest rates below our star. Clearly, this scenario would be highly undecided. It would entail lower output and welfare. It would further erode the policy space of monetary policy. It would create more pressures on and due to the low interest rate, also strong incentives for highly expansionary fiscal policy, ultimately endangering fiscal sustainability and central bank independence. It is only a small step to imagine scenarios of fiscal dominance in this case, clearly. In such a scenario, using a star as a guidepost uh, would be self-defeating since we would erode our policy space by depressing growth and productivity even further. So let me summarize. The current mainstream assumption is a star is exogenous to monetary policy. 
A star is therefore regarded as a useful guidepost for monetary policy decisions, despite the uncertainty surrounding its measurement. However, a, stay, a star may also be endogenous with respect to monetary policy. If anything, so far policymakers consider only the benign case that expansionary monetary policy might prevent hysteresis and thus help prevent a further reduction of stock. But the unfavorable case of a vicious circle between highly expansionary monetary policy for a very long time and falling a star cannot be discarded. Monetary policy should adopt a cautious approach on this. But what I think we all agree is that there's a need to increase a star for reasons that go beyond monetary policy decision. This implies that fiscal and structural policies are urgently needed to implement policy that contributes to solving the population aging problem and to foster productivity. As central bankers, we can, we should use more persuasion to encourage such policies. The purpose of this workshop is to offer an opportunity to bring the pillar minds together to uh, explore these uh, options and, uh, and uh, that we have and we should pursue in raising a star. With this, sir, I finish my introduction remarks and I'm happy to hold, hand over now uh, to uh, Deham uh, for his uh, presentation. Uh, Jakob, over to you. Thank you very much, Governor Holtzman. Um, thank you for this very illuminating uh, talk, which I think perfectly sets the scene uh, for today's uh, event. Um, and also, thank you very much for uh, your very uh, strong support for SWERF and all, it, all of its activities. It's highly appreciated. Um, now, let's continue uh, with the first uh, keynote. Uh, I'm very happy uh, that Claudio Borio accepted our invitation uh, to give this uh, keynote. Uh, Claudio has uh, extensively uh, published uh, about this issue that we are talking about, uh, as already referred to uh, by Governor Holtzman. Um, I very much liked uh, uh, the paper in which he showed that many of the acclaimed um, drivers uh, of the R star uh, were not so uh, impressive uh, in terms of their statistical significance uh, after all. Uh, so I very much look forward uh, to his uh, no doubt inspiring views uh, on uh, the topic of today. Claudio, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Jakub. After those kind, very, very kind words, I think uh, you're setting me up for disappointment, but uh, I'll try and, and do my best. It's, it's always a great pleasure for me to, to be back at SUWERF events. Today, I, I would like to explore with you one question. As the title suggests, is it safe or hazardous to navigate by, by our star? Now, you can imagine this is a delicate question. So all the views that I will be expressing are very much my own, and this will allow me to be a little bit more provocative and to hopefully generate more discussion. Why is this question worth asking? Well, we heard this quite clearly. The, the concept of our star has risen to prominence in policymaking following the great financial crisis. And all you need to do is just look at the number of references that you can find in the central bank speeches, which have uh, shot up. Now, the concept is quite prominent in influencing communication strategies and even the reviews of monetary policy frameworks. Reasons? Well, they are not hard to find. Nominal interest rates have dropped to their lowest in history since records began. Real interest rates have never been uh, negative for as long as they have now, not even during the great inflation era, and I suspect, therefore, also since records began. So, as a result of all this, the monetary policy room for maneuver has declined considerably. Three takeaways from my presentation, if you like, I'm in the red, red square that we, we saw before. First of all, our star is very imprecisely measured and contains rather little information uh, in addition to what is contained in measures of potential output or uh, the natural rate of unemployment. So it need not play a significant role in setting the policy stance on a day-to-day -day basis, and I don't think this is controversial. The more contentious point is that depending on its use, depending on its use, our star has the potential 
to lead policy astray. And I think here the key is the view that R star is independent of monetary policy and little affected by financial factors, which to my mind can compli complicate the task of raising, regaining the room for policy maneuver. And finally, if those two propositions are roughly correct, then I think there is a case for greater flexibility in the pursuit of tightly defined inflation targets within credible monetary policy regimes, which would facilitate regaining that precious room for policy maneuver. Now, by flexibility, I mean tolerance for shortfalls of inflation from target, even if these shortfalls are persistent. Now, this would be very good news for central banks because it would mean that they have greater degrees of freedom than R star would suggest when trying to regain room for policy maneuver. So the roadmap, I will first of all analyze the concept. I will then evaluate its usefulness as a guide to policy and finally make some preliminary policy suggestions. So the concept, R star is defined as the short term real interest rate that in steady state, in, in the absence of shocks, equilibrates the goods market, saving an investment with output at potential so that inflation is stable. And in virtually all representations, R star is independent of monetary policy, materially independent of monetary policy. A couple of implications follow. First of all, R star is, we know, an unobservable variable, an abstract concept. And second, the existence of R star does not imply that saving an investment directly determine any market interest rate. In fact, quite plausibly, they do not. Now, we know how market interest rates are determined. We know that the central bank sets a nominal interest rate, the overnight rate, uh, and with prices effectively predetermined at that horizon, it sets the exposed real interest rate, and with expectation sluggish, also the ex ante real interest rate. Now, the influence of the central bank further out in the yield curve is more indirect, but still pervasive as a result of signaling and as a result of asset purchases. Now, if this is true at any given point in time, it must be true. It must be true at all points in time. So that the central bank always sets the market short-term real interest rate. So what can people logically mean when they say that the central bank does not set the real interest rate in steady state in the long run. Well, they must mean that the central bank has no alternative but to set the market real interest rate consistent with this independently determined R star. Now, why should that be the case? Why could that be the case? Well, presumably, because unless the central bank does so on average or over time, the economy will veer off and force the central bank to do so. Now, given the definition of R star, veering off track means deviating from output, deviating from potential, which in turn means that inflation will change. In other words, veering off, veering off track inevitably involves inflation. So you can think of inflation as a kind of invisible hand that takes the central bank to its destination. Now, guide for policy. Well, I would suggest, and I think it's pretty obvious, that if you want to have a good guide for policy, this guide has to have two properties. First, it must be measurable with sufficient precision. And second, it must be consistent with good economic outcomes. Well, property one matters for R star as a guide when setting the monetary policy stance within a given strategy, given framework. The second property matters because R star as a concept could still influence the monetary policy strategy, the monetary policy framework, even if it was not measured precisely. And this because the framework, the strategy depend on fundamental views about what, how we think the economy works, which are embedded in the concept of R star. Now, let me consider each of these two um, properties in turn. Measurement. Well, I have a long discussion in the, in the paper, but here, let me just make uh, five uh, key points. The first is that different approaches, as we saw in the graph, yield very different levels of R star, so that at any given point in time, it's very, very hard to tell whether R star is above or below the, the market rate. Second, one key reason for this is that the Phillips curve is unreliable. 
are unreliable in the sense that it is hard to estimate and very flat, which magnifies any errors in the estimation in the mapping from inflation to, to R star. Third, R star contains very little additional information about inflation beyond what is contained in measures of potential output or measures of the natural rate of unemployment. And of course, and although, and let me stress, those measures themselves are very hard to estimate. At least they have a more direct link to inflation. Put these three points together, and there is a fourth one, an implication, which is that R star can be dispensed with when setting monetary policy on a day-to-day -day basis. And indeed, I think it very much was so before the great financial crisis, and I guess that a number of central banks still do. Now, the first, fifth of the observation is very, very different, is that having said all this, having said all this, all methods indicate that since the mid-1980s, R star has fallen. In a way, this is not that surprising because most meth methods are constrained to yield R star estimates that do not really deviate much from market interest rates. And in fact, if they did, we probably would not take them seriously. Now, the exception to all this are estimates of R star derived from the yield curve, from forward rates in the yield curve, which also allow for the possibility of the unobservable term premium to move down over time. And indeed, some of those basically would suggest that R star may well have changed very little. So much for the first property, measurement. What about the second property, consistency with good economic outcomes? I think here the view that R star is independent of monetary policy is key as part of the broader view that monetary policy is neutral. Now, to my mind, this real nominal dichotomy can be taken too far, and it may tend to overestimate monetary policy's influence on inflation and underestimate its influence on the real economy over medium and longer term horizons that are important for, for policy making. Notably, notably through its impact on financial factors. Now, either way, a, sim a, similar, a similar result would follow. That is, basing, pay, excuse me, basing, basing policies on those beliefs can complement regaining the room for policy maneuver over time, which in turn can contribute, or as a result of contributing, to macroeconomic and financial instability. Why is this the case? Well, it has to do with the inflation process itself and with the role of financial factors in the economy. Now, let me take each of these two points in turn. Inflation first. Well, the view that R star is independent of monetary policy can greatly constrain the central bank when seeking to regain room for policy maneuver. Because the only way of doing so, the only way, is to reduce interest rates today, is monetary policy to raise inflation tomorrow so that the nominal rate can rise alongside inflation. So that paradoxically, perhaps, to gain policy room tomorrow on a sustainable basis requires losing it today. Now you can see what the problem can be. If inflation is not sufficiently responsive to monetary policy, then there is a material risk of losing policy headroom if the hoped for increase in inflation does not materialize to the necessary extent. And the post GFC experience could, could be read in this line, in, along these lines. Now, what about the role of financial factors? Well, the mechanism for the loss in the room for policy maneuver here takes root in the nexus between monetary policy, the financial cycle, and again, yes, of course, inflation because this can give rise to an asymmetric reaction function for the central bank. The story goes like this. On the one hand, if inflation is stable as financial and business cycles mature, then there is no need to tighten. And indeed, there is an incentive to adjust upwards estimates of potential output and therefore downward estimates of the natural interest rate so that monetary policy, the stance of monetary policy, would look tighter than would otherwise be the case, which in turn would validate the, the policy stance. Now, on the other hand, it's only natural and indeed necessary to ease during contractions and to do so energetically and for long if the debt, if a debt overhang exists and if a 
banking crisis breaks out. Now you can see that how this can generate a long-term trend, downward trend in the nominal interest rate over successive business and financial cycles and give an infl a stable inflation rate also in real interest rates over time. Indeed, it can also raise the possibility of what one might call a debt trap, whereby in the process, private and public debt in relation to GDP continues to rise, the economy becomes more sensitive to increases in interest rates, which in turn makes it harder to raise interest rates. So a kind of process whereby low, rate, low rates beget lower rates. Now, this outcome would be more likely if, first of all, the impact of real interest rates on aggregate demand uh, was to fall as nominal interest rate declined below certain thresholds and stayed there, and if the impact of the debt service ratio on aggregate demand is, is important. And there is, there is indeed evidence for both of these uh, propositions. Now, if you look at what happened since the 19 since the mid 1980s, say, you will see that the picture is broadly consistent with what I have just described. Real interest rates have been falling and the debt to GDP ratio in aggregate across the world, private and public, has been rising relative to GDP. And it's quite telling that all this started in the mid 1980s when a major change in the nature of the business cycle took place. We basically shifted from inflation induced to financial cycle induced recessions. That is from the recessions that were before driven by an increasing interest rates in order to try and bring inflation under control to recessions that are associated with the contraction of a big financial boom. In other words, in this new environment, which by now is not so new, changes in inflation lose their significance as indicators of disequilibrium in the goods market and financial imbalances gain it. Now, if this is true, or if this is approximately correct, I think two implications for the notion of R star follow. The first is that thinking of R star as a reliable policy guide is hazardous because it has the potential of leading policy astray. And second, thinking of R star as independent of monetary policy may not be that helpful because what monetary policy takes as exogenous at any given time takes it as exogenous today, can be the result of past policy decisions. You can think of this as a form of monetary policy hysteresis, or if you like, another form of time inconsistency. Now, in a recent paper with co-authors, we try and model all this. Now, the model has two key features. First of all, the central bank sets the real interest rates at all points in time, the short-term short rate. And you have the endogenous financial and business cycles because we model a kind of game in the uh, credit market so that banks are very aggressive during expansions and very prudent during contractions, which I think is quite realistic. So this has two implications for the concept of R star. First, the very concept itself is rather ill-defined because there is a, a sort of trajectory for business and financial cycles associated with each trajectory for the real interest rate. So that there is no R star which can, can be regarded as a kind of structural fixed point characterizing the steady state. In addition, if one assumes a certain degree of inertia in the reaction function because of adjustment costs, then it is indeed possible to get a downward trend of the real interest rate over successive business and financial cycles, which is a characterization, an example of a debt trap. Now, ours is not the only paper that endogenizes R star with respect to monetary policy in the context of these financial uh, kind of factors. And that generates the possibility of a debt trap. And this is, for example, the more famous, although it came later, paper by Mian and Sufi uh, that does not have cycles, but generates the possibility of a debt trap through the interaction of debt, wealth distribution, and the marginal propensity to consume. So much for theory, what about evidence? Let, let me mention just a couple of pieces of evidence here. The first one is specific to the financial cycle. Now, financial cycle induced recessions, especially if they have banking, if they come along with banking crisis, tend to have very persistent, or if not even permanent effects on output, 
by which I mean the output level of the growth rate, and there is plenty of empirical evidence to this effect. Now, if one allows for the possibility of monetary policy to have an impact on the financial cycle through, say, credit expansion or through uh, asset prices or through, indeed, risk-taking, then it stands to reason that monetary policy will also have an impact on the on our star, defined as the rate that will equilibrate output and potential. Now, the second piece of evidence, which was mentioned by uh, Governor Holzman, is that if you let the data speak, and if you look at the long data span before going back before the mid 1980s, which, by the way, was the Volcker shock, mid 1980s was a huge monetary shock. And if you examine the relationship between the usual uh, assume the postulated drivers of saving and investment, in particular demographics, but you name it, in uh, income distribution, marginal product capital, productivity growth, whatever, the usual suspects on the one hand, and various different measures of our star from various combinations of market rates to filtered estimates of our star a la Laubach and Williams. Then you will reach two conclusions. The first one is that Although you can find a relationship since the mid 1980s, if you go further back in history, you don't quite see any systematic relationship. And moreover, if you consider the relationship between interest rates, these R stars, and monetary policy regimes, you do find evidence of such a, relation, a relationship, even if you control for the usual suspects. So this takes me to policy a very preliminary considerations about policy. Now, if the previous analysis is broadly correct, broadly reasonable, um, then what could be the implications for the broad direction of policy, the direction of travel? Uh, well, I would personally draw three inferences. First, that it would be desirable to have considerable flexibility in the pursuit of tightly defined inflation targets. Second, that it would be desirable to use that flexibility to reestablish pressures policy headroom. Headroom that it is necessary to face the inevitable future recessions and also the unexpected, like a COVID crisis or climate change emergency. And third, that it would be desirable to search for complementary monetary policy guides. Now, first of all, let me talk about flexibility a little bit uh, in more detail. By flexibility, as I said at the beginning, I mean tolerance for transitory but persistent shortfalls of inflation from point targets, unless, of course, they become uncomfortably large with the degree of what uncomfortable means to be defined, and, of course, if they endanger credibility. Now, the key here is always to have a sufficiently long policy horizon. One could then use this flexibility to remove accommodation as the strength of the real economy allows. One could call this kind of opportunistic removal of accommodation or opportunistic tightening. Now, importantly, this flexibility would also help manage the intertemporal trade-offs that arise as a result of financial cycles, as a result of the uh, relentless increase in debt to GDP ratios, so that you can be quite expansionary, you can raise employment output in the short term, but at the possible cost of a larger, of a bigger uh, problem down the road. Now, if you were to, what would be necessary in order to make such a strategy feasible? Well, I think that two, one would need to allay two policy concerns, and I think are, are quite legitimate, that can inhibit authorities from following this. The first one is a concern that inflation could drift down in an uncontrollable fashion. And the second, the concern that there are large costs with deflation. By deflation, I mean persistent declines in the price level. Now, take each point in turn. First of all, I think that there is evidence, there is evidence that within an established regime of low and stable inflation, there is a certain tendency for inflation to remain range bound. Now, in, in a paper that will appear next week in the BIS quarterly review, so I would strongly encourage you to, to read it, um, we basically look at US data 
a very finely disaggregated price level data, 131 expenditure categories uh, over a very, very long time span. And uh, that analysis leads to three key findings, which together point to the, this possibility of a higher ten greater tendency for inflation to be range bound. The first one is that at low inflation rates, the bulk of inflation, the bulk of inflation reflects idiosyncratic or sector specific price changes. So that the common component of inflation, which is the closest to the theoretical right concept of inflation, a generalized increase in prices, falls a lot and it is dominated by this idiosyncratic component. Second piece of evidence, which is consistent with the first, is that the pass through of outsized, outsized price changes into core inflation falls a lot. And finally, that the transitory component of inflation increases and becomes dominant, which is consistent, of course, with the widespread decline in persistence. Now, if this is the case, then you can see how there would be a greater tendency for inflation to be range bound. Now, why could this be the case? Well, of course, one reason is credibility of the monetary policy regime. Another complementary reason, which I actually find quite appealing, is the idea of uh, rational inattention. That is the fact that if inflation moves relatively little, it will have a little, imp little impact on agents' welfare, agents' well-being, and therefore it will tend to affect very little their behavior. And for many of you, uh, many of you may be familiar that this is very much the definition that Alan Greenspan gave to price stability, which I think is a very apt definition. Second condition. Now, there is evidence that the cost of deflation may be overestimated. If you have a close look at the historical record again, it's always so important to look at history. Then there is no empirical evidence of a tendency for, uh, for deflation to generate costly spirals, or indeed of a systematic link between deflation and output weakness. Now, the Great Depression is an exception, or I would say a partial exception to be looked at uh, further. Now, the um, why could this be the case? Why it, could it be the case that if you look at the historical record, you don't see such a close link? Well, of course, we know that a priori, the link between deflation and output is, is ambiguous. For simplicity, it will depend on whether the uh, deflation is driven by a contraction in demand or an increase in supply. And by the way, all the structural factors that have been pointed to as possible drivers of persistent disinflationary pressures in the world since the uh, 1990s are in fact favorable benign supply side factors globalization technology increases in the labor force so that if this is the case well then one could interpret the evidence as indicated indicating that deflations historically have been mainly supply supply driven and finally, what about complementary guideposts? Well, this is a question that requires much uh, more thought. Um, but here, also because of the time, that just let me make just a couple of suggestions. Now, the, what is the key principle here? The key principle will be to try and reintroduce a degree of countercyclicality in monetary policy during expansions. How could this be done? Well, one way might be to pay more systematic attentions to measures of the financial cycle. And there are quite a number of those. And in an empirical paper with co-authors, we show how one such measure could work. But this is using just US data, and one would have to look at the robustness of all this. Another possibility would actually be to look at, say, for example, nominal, nominal income, nominal income targeting, but without the makeup component. But again, I'm not making any specific proposals. All I'm doing here is try to encourage people to look into this more systematically. So what's the conclusion? Well, navigating by, uh, by the stars proved to be very safe for sailors for centuries until, of course, new instrumentation came along. I think it can be more hazardous for economic policymakers, and our star is a case in point. Now, when the sky is cloudy, I think it's hard to tell where the stars are, or indeed, how many of them there are. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claudio. Um, 
you were afraid that you would disappoint me, but uh, quite to the contrary, as usual, uh, you give uh, a very uh, inspiring and thought provoking uh, speech. So thank you very much uh, for that. Um, I presume that many of the participants uh, may have questions uh, for you, but I suggest that we leave uh, that for the Q&A uh, after we uh, have heard uh, the uh, contributions uh, of uh, the three discussions. Uh, and in this case, we start with uh, uh, Maria Valderrama from the uh, Austrian uh, Central Bank. Uh, Maria, the floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, my talk today uh, about monetary policy and productivity uh, is based, um, is, is part of, um, it was part of the strategy review process of the Euro system. And uh, there was a work stream that was uh, about productivity and there was a subgroup uh, that looked at um, monetary policy and productivity. And what I'm presenting today is uh, joint work with people from not only the, the, the ECB, but from so some other central banks. And what I'm presenting here is going to be part of one of the occasional papers that is going to be uh, published um, next week. And some of the more detail um, results that I'm presenting will also be um, work, working papers on themselves. Um, so the motivation for uh, this report was um, to discuss the possible positive or negative effects of monetary policy and productivity developments, responding basically to this concern uh, that many of you, I think, uh, have, have uh, voiced in the in the past that monetary policy or at least the effect the, the, the fact that negative interest rates or the ultra loose monetary policy for such a long time could have unintended side effects on productivity and what we did um, in this in this group was try to structure both like the theoretical empirical literature that was out there um, and we we structure in first looking at monetary policy and the productivity of incumbent firms that is basically the intensive margin and then looking at the um the effect and the entry of firms with the extensive margin and that is the way we structure the report and we look at um and look at uh, empirical evidence and that will be the 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 outline of my talk and of course at the end i will um, give some summary and conclusions so um, with respect to the, to the effect of monetary policy on incumbent firms and the productivity incumbent firms, we started when, with um, endogenous growth models where because monetary policy has an effect on the business cycle, it will, through the incentives on, uh, on investment, um, have a positive effect on productivity. Uh, and in some of these endogenous growth models, these positive effects go beyond uh, the cyclical effects, but are more persistent. Um, if you extend that kind of models, um, the effect of monetary policy becomes ambiguous, especially if you take into account uh, financial frictions. Um, and there, there are uh, several channels, and this is also there are different theoretical papers, but a lot of the empirical literature has looked at what happens, what is the effect of monetary policy and on firms or on the investment or on productivity if you have, for example, uh, credit constraints or you have incentives, less incentives for balance sheet repair and so on. And what we also find in this literature is that um, monetary policy can also have ambiguous effects on the effect of resource allocation because you can have, for example, those are the typical examples, you will have uh, the construction sector, which has a uh, very high collateral, but is low productive versus the uh, young firms that may be very productive, but because they're young or because they have intangible assets, um, suffer more from uh, asymmetric information. And then the resource allocation there could be pervasive. And of course, to that kind of mechanism, you sum up the behavior of banks that may subsidize low productive firms for different reasons, either because um, they, they have problems in their balance sheets themselves or because the firms are large uh, and so on, then that, that is also something that we find in the liter literature. Um, as I said, it's both theoretical and empirical. And at the end of the day, the effect and the net effect of uh, monetary policy and productivity is ambiguous and uh, has to be determined empirically. And this is what we tried to do in the report. So we have uh, some pieces of evidence. And of course, one of the things uh, of looking at this question is that 
uh, if you use uh, microdata, if you use it, uh, study it at the firm level, the availability of data is not always uh, the best. So we start um, first with an exercise that was carried out by the colleagues of the Banco de España. And what they uh, question or, or they try to answer is, does an expansionary monetary policy improve or worsen the allocation of resources? And here, um, they proxy allocation of resources by looking at the within sector dispersion in the marginal revenue productivity of capital for three different countries where there was uh, available data, Spain, Portugal, and Italy. And they find that following an expected monetary policy shock, the resource allocation actually improves. Uh, and this is basically because Firms with higher, um, with high marginal revenue productivity of capital invest relatively more than other firms following an, uh, a positive monetary policy shock. Now, what they also did with uh, data from Banco de España, which is a little bit more granular, is that they look at, uh, at the firm level, what is driving um, this, this effect. And what you find there is like what the literature would um, would uh, predict that it is those young firms and those or firms with low markup that were financially uh, constrained before. After the monetary policy shock, the financial constraint uh, is less binding and then they are able to uh, to invest more. Another uh, piece of evidence um, is done uh, was done with the SAFE uh, survey. This is the survey of access to finance uh, from, from the ECB, which is done for um, it includes uh, many countries, and this is analysis from the colleagues of the ECB. And here, uh, the question is, well, does access to finance uh, following a, also an accommodative monetary policy decision, does it uh, favor weak firms, like that will be like the, the, the pervasive effect of monetary policy, or there's no effect on, on weak firms? And here, what you can see, the graphic in the, the right side, um, my mouse is lost here in the graphic in the right side, is that following mon certain monetary policy decisions, for example, the OMT or the introduction of the, of the first TLTROs, access to finance actually increased for all firms. But we see, and this is the, the line, the red line, those are the firms that we classify as vulnerable firms. And here there's, there are different robustness checks. How, you, how, do you, um, how do you classify vulnerable firms? There's not only one way of, of classifying a vulnerable firm. And here what you see is that there was an increase in the access to finance, but it was less for those firms that were vulnerable or, or they were weak in, in, for, in, in some type of definition. Um, the only exception here, and this is also consistent with what, we, what has been found in the literature, is for large firms which have an interest coverage ratio less than one for uh, three consecutive years. And this, again, will have to do with the fact that large firms have more market power or banks or the footprint that they will leave uh, in, in the bank balance sheet is larger and therefore they tend to have more access to finance even if they're weak. And um, the last piece of evidence uh, on this part on the incumbent firms uh, comes with data, comes from the Bank de France. Um, the Bank de France has very nice uh, data and that they can, on one hand, um, they can look at which interest rate do firms uh, become on, on, on their lending. And then they have also the credit rate rating on, on the firm. So when they ma match, uh, lending or uh, bank loans and, and firm data, they know um, the, the price of the loan and they know the credit rating of the firm. And this allows them to see, to, to analyze whether banks give to weak firms or uh, weak firms um, interest rate that will be lower than um, that would be granted because of the credit rating, basically. Uh, and they define this like zombie firms would be the firms that have that have low credit quality but are paying a very low uh, interest rate and um, they do this for a number of years and as you can see in the graph to the right um, this is first a very small share of the universe of, of firms that, that get uh, loans from uh, from french banks and this um, has um, and this share uh, has been more or less stable over the years um, so that basically the conclusion is that there is from this point of view, there's not a lot of credit misallocation in France. Okay, um, the next 
part of the report looks at the extensive margin. So we looked at what is the effect of monetary policy and the net entry of firms. And here, I think the discussion is uh, well known. The idea is that an expansive monetary policy uh, will uh, favor entry into the market and at the same time it will delay exit because the productivity or the profit uh, 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 threshold um, has has fallen. Uh, and here the the effect, the net effect on, on, on productivity on the aggregate productivity is even more difficult uh, to determine because you can observe more entry or less entry into the market following a monetary policy shock or you delay exit, but you don't have a lot of information of how productive these firms are and how much they add to the aggregate productivity to how they how much they subtract from the total productivity. Uh, and here you have also the the same kind of um, arguments that there if there, if there are financial frictions, then banks or firms will um, you know delay uh, exit because um, they they're trying to survive in the market or banks try to keep. Um, um, weak loans or weak firms and, and, and their balance sheet for different reasons. And then there's another uh, effect, which we, of course, um, could not really look at with, with firm data, is the contagion effects um, from the fact that if you are keeping alive uh, weak firms, then there are less resources in the, in the economy for more productive firms. Um, and here we have um, two pieces of evidence. Uh, one was um, looking at the share of zombie firms in the in the euro area, and this is also the question: is is the share of zombie firms uh, is it is it increasing? Is it do we see a secular increase? Uh, and for the countries uh, where we have data, <clears throat> sorry, I'm running out of voice and time, I guess. <coughs> sorry. Uh, for the for the share for the data for the countries that we have data, we see that the share of Somali firms uh, has actually decreased up to uh, 2017, which is the la last available data that we have, um, and that this includes also, also Germany. And one thing that is interesting um, from the from the graph in the middle, which includes five uh, five euro area countries, is that we observe some cyclical um, some cyclical movement in the share of firms uh, that are classified as zombies. Uh, and what we also see is that even if they are zombies, the share and the total uh, of the economy is rather small and rather stable. Uh, what is interesting from this analysis also is that we we look at, okay, we see the cyclical um, cyclical uh, movement or the cyclical pattern and the and the share of zombie firms in these countries. What is driving um, that? And what we see is that the exit rate, so the 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 share of zombies that uh, disappear or that they're not zombies anymore, uh, is rather stable over over time and. Um, at least for the sample that we have, whereas the entry rate uh, and with entry rate, we we uh, mean the, the 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 firms, the share of firms that become distressed or that become zombies, that is very cyclical and um, seems to be. Um, um, yeah, well, uh, basically the reason for the for the increase in, in zombie firms is that there are more firms uh, that become zombies, whereas the ones that are zombies already, they are uh, rather stable. And um, we can have also some piece of evidence as well of these firms that are zombie firms, are they all firms that are distressed? And here we see that on one hand of those firms that become zombies, uh, about a quarter of those firms are actually growing firms. So they're classified as zombies, not because they are zombies, but they're, they, they will at some point uh, recuperate. And we, what we also see in the right-hand side graph is that, um, is that of those zombie firms, um, as we saw, the, the entry rate or the exit rate of, of being zombie is very stable. And a lot of them, more than half of it, when they exit the zombie status, um, it is not because they're dying, but they, it's because they are actually recovering from their zombie status. And, um, and that shows that the, the low interest rates seems to have um, help some firms uh, recover and from going to, from zombie firms to, to normal firms, but at the same time, it may be uh, prolonging the survival of low profitability firms. Um, good, I hope I was in time. Um, let me now conclude. Um, so what we tried to do in the note, and of course, this is a, a much larger report, um, that is that we tried, first of all, to highlight the many channels that are at play, that 
factors, not only the endogenous growth models, but depending on which assumptions you have about uh, financial frictions or the interaction with, uh, with the, the institutional framework, the effect of monetary policy and productivity um, is going to be ambiguous. Um, we, we see from the data that it will vary across times, um, sectors and regions, and has to be determined empirically. Uh, and what we found, and with the evidence that we had for a sample of, of euro area countries, is that the commodity monetary policy at the last years helped actually to improve resource allocation and by losing the constraints of firms that were relatively more productive, but uh, before were uh, more financially constrained. We see that, um, on the other hand, we don't find um, evidence of credit misallocation um, because firm banks are not uh, favoring weak firms or are subsidizing work firms, except um, those large firms with low profits, which is um, yeah, something that is very often found in the literature. And uh, in terms of the extensive margin, we see that policy and a commodity monetary policy has helped uh, firms that are distressed to recover. While, of course, it is um, prolonging the life of some of those uh, weak firms or low profitability firms, but that share uh, in, in, the, in the total population of firms uh, is very low. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Maria, for this excellent presentation. A very interesting and very relevant uh, results, I think. Um, and also perfectly on time. So that means that we can quickly go on uh, with the next presentation, uh, which will be done by Isabel van Steenkist. So let me start with the presentation by actually thanking the organizers for, for having me here to present. Um, I'm planning to give some uh, um, reflections today on the interaction between monetary and fiscal policy and our star. Um, so, as you can see in the disclaimer, as usual, um, coming from the central bank, I have to say that these are my own views, but in fact, um, I'm here as a sole presenter, but reflecting uh, a lot of work that was done in the context on the work stream on monetary and fiscal policy interaction for the strategy review. So, this work stream comprised members um, similar to what Maria already was clarifying on from the ECB and NCBs. There were a lot of participants in, in the case of this work stream, so I couldn't list them all on the slide. But I can tell you that the report will be published at the end of the month, so I, I very much encourage everybody to go and look there because the report um, actually discusses much more than just reflections on the interaction between monetary and fiscal policy and, and uh, our start. It, it really has a much broader scope on issues that you want to discuss on monetary and fiscal policy interaction. But for today, and given the topic of the workshop, um, I'm really going to zoom in on, on, on this interaction between monetary and fiscal policy on the one hand and our star. I mean, I will bring this uh, in from the angle of monetary fiscal policy interaction, and I will weave in considerations on our star as I go along, and, and, and I hope you will uh, see that as I flip through the slides. Um, so let me maybe start and, and take you a little bit back in time, and, and as mentioned, taking things from the angle of monetary fiscal policy interaction, um, and, and starting to think of the cases or the situation we had in uh, the times before the global financial crisis, namely a time when our star was some margin away from, from zero. And in these days, I mean, there was quite some consensus about how monetary and fiscal policy should interact. I mean, in fact, there was a view that there should be a division of labor between the two. Um, on the one hand, we thought monetary policy, we should have an independent central bank, which should have the sole responsibility over ensuring price stability. And at the same time, we had the view that fiscal authorities should provide automatic stabilizers, focus on other objectives. I'm thinking here, for instance, on equity or um, efficiency, and at the same time, ensuring sustainability of, of, of debt. Now, this view applied to the one central bank, one fiscal authority case. It also extended to monetary union cases, such as the euro area. Of course, as usual, the setup of a monetary union brings about its own uh, complexities. And these implied, at least in this case, that, for instance, um, central bank independence becomes even more um, compelling as a, as, as a framework. And at the same time, of course, the fact that one has to deal with many fiscal authorities, um, because at country level, you have fiscal authorities, one central bank. That means that you need to maybe have a fiscal framework um, to deal with uh, the debt externalities. 
Now, this framework was basically considered in a time where, where the concern, and it was driven by the experiences and concerns at the time, namely that there were upside risks to price stability. Now, if you look more recently, I mean, the literature has evolved quite a bit. Some nuances have come about in how monetary fiscal policy should interact. Uh, we have a, a generally more, more nuanced and, 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 and shaded view on this. Um, and part of this is, of course, because of new developments in the literature, but an important element in, in this thinking has been the changing economic environment. And, and I want to zoom in on this because, of course, that brings us to the debate of today on, on, on our star. And I want to just show you here to, to, to bring that point across, but I'm sure you'll see many charts on, 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 on this or, or on, on these aspects. And these are the new economic environment that is particularly relevant for the interaction between monetary and fiscal policy. And one is that we have entered, I mean, I would almost say, if you look on the chart on the left, we entered a period where the interest rate growth differential has turned negative. So this is a chart that uh, shows some aggregates across advanced economies showing that this is basically not just a phenomenon in one country, but it's more widespread. And at the same time, of course, we've seen policy rates since the 80s decline, I mean, more or less following in lockstep with the decline that we have in the estimates of our star. And of course, that means that uh, conventional monetary policy space has, has become increasingly constrained. Now, a question we can ask uh, is how, how did we get here? And actually, this chart on the left was already shown by, by Governor, Governor Holtzman. Um, it's based basically on work um, by the Working Group on Econometric Modeling at the ECB. I mean, they have published a report on this. They used a variety of models to estimate our star in the euro area. And of course, um, as Claudio Borio mentioned, there is some uncertainty. You can see here the model uncertainty that we have in all range of models. But what the models do agree on is that there has been a steady decline in our star since the 80s, as has already been discussed. Now I can think of what were the drivers of that, and, and here um, several factors have been put forward. One is the decline in trend growth. Another factor has been demographic change. And then since the global financial crisis, some additional factors have pushed down on uh, our star. And these inc are including the rise in risk aversion, an increase on flight to safety. And I add here also an element that is relevant for the euro area, the fiscal consolidation. And in particular, changes in the composition of fiscal policy may have actually exacerbated in the euro area the decline in R star and started the onset of the low inflation period in the euro area. So I want to elaborate a little bit on that, but just before uh, on this latter point before that, but just if you look at this slide as a whole, I mean, what we could expect, especially given where we see demographic changes going forward and seeing that this has been an important factor driving R star down is that this factor is likely to continue to put downward pressure on our star going forward. And so we are likely to, to be in this environment where our star is low for some time to come. So it's worth thinking about what it means for monetary fiscal interactions in the environment. But before I do so, let me just give a little bit of details on, on this point on the fiscal consolidation and particular decomposition of fiscal policy. And here in the euro area, I'm thinking in particular in, in the years of the sovereign debt crisis in some countries and, and, and the years um, shortly following thereafter. And so what we tend to see, I mean, and this is generally a political economy argument, is, you know, in times of crisis, um, it's easier or it's more likely that governments will cut on, on, on public investment that does not only benefit current but also future taxpayers, rather than cutting on general government expenditures, which, you know, benefit current taxpayers. And, and this is, um, studies by the Commission have shown this, but this is also what this chart on the right shows. So, it shows basically on the x-axis uh, the change in public investment to GDP ratio. And on the y-axis, it shows the change in the debt increase basically between 99 and 2008 across euro area countries. And you can clearly see that there is this link with uh, higher increases in debt um, when the consolidation came by force at times. Um, you know, it, it led to disproportionate cuts in public investment. The chart on the left is just uh, to illustrate that it, it was not really the fiscal framework in Europe, so, so um, the deficit rule, for instance, that, that had an impact on, on this. It was really more um, the needed consolidation that came in the, in the time following the sovereign debt crisis. And of course, we know that public investment is positively correlated to private investment and GDP. So, of course, these developments can also have a dampening effect on, on, on potential growth and thereby our start. But now let me come back again to, to the discussion on monetary fiscal interaction. And, and as I mentioned, um, we are in an environment where monetary policy, at least conventional policy, is, is increasingly constrained. And of course, that has important implications for the monetary fiscal interaction. 
So in, in the normal times, when you think of monetary fiscal policy interaction and monetary and fiscal policy, we say risks working against each other. And, and what do I mean with that? When, well, when we see an, a, a discretionary increase in fiscal spending, and this leads to higher inflation, this is very likely to be offset in normal, normal quote unquote times. So times I mean where R star is some margin away from, from zero and, and there is uh, space in the conventional monetary policy. In those times, monetary policy will likely respond to this increase uh, in, in, in inflation. Now, of course, that would really lead to an, an increase in the real interest rates. And as a result, you know, you would have a crowding out of private consumption and investment at a time when you would see an increase in discretionary fiscal spending. Now, if, if you look at the current situation where monetary policy, the standard monetary policy is more constrained, but also inflation is low, then, of course, you know, you would likely not expect monetary policy to respond to such a discretionary fiscal increase. And as a result, you would see an increase in inflation, but also an increase in private consumption and investment. So suddenly we're in an environment where you could say fiscal policy has become relevant for macroeconomic stabilization. And of course, we've seen many estimates that we have seen larger fiscal multipliers and larger spillovers, um, fiscal spillovers in such an environment. So we could say overall in a low inflation regime like we are for the moment, fiscal and monetary policy need to work together to exit the regime. Just to illustrate these larger fiscal multipliers as spillovers, um, which are particularly relevant in discussion, of course, in the monetary union, to show here some simulations that were done using a DSGE model in the context of the work stream work. And so this model looks at two cases in terms of fiscal spillover, the case when you have reactive interest rates, which is shown on the left, and the case when you have non-reactive interest rates, which is shown on the right. So on the left, you, saw, you show basically on the x-axis the impact to two years average percentage change increase in the GDP in the country that propagates a fiscal shock. And on the y-axis, we see their impact in two years on average on the GDP on the country that received the spillovers on the other side. And what you can see, I focus here now just for instance on government consumption, is actually that the spillover when you have reactive interest rates is negative. And the reason is basically that the positive effect from the fiscal impulse and the spillovers from that through increased demand is more than offset by the negative impact from the increase in interest rates. We don't see that for public investment, which tends to have generally positive spillovers, but small. But of course, if you move to the case of the non-reactive interest rates, you see that spillovers are positive and much larger. So you see the, the, the magnitudes on the, on the y-axis are, are much larger. So this basically overall tells you that in an environment where uh, conventional policy is constrained or increasingly constrained, you know, you could see a, an, an increasing role for fiscal policy in terms of contributing to macro stabilization. However, at the same time, in that kind of environment, interactions also become more complex. So things are not as simple as I now just presented them. And of course, the first complexity that comes into the picture is that this new role for fiscal policy brings to fore a difficult trade-off for fiscal authorities between stabilization and debt sustainability. In fact, just to recall you back to the two charts I had shown you earlier in the presentation, and one of them showing that R minus G is negative, I mean, that's quite an important predicament for the stabilization role for fiscal policy. And in fact, currently we are in such an environment, but when we see debt becoming high, of course, this kind of uh, relationship could become fragile and can quickly turn around. So that is one complexity you need to take into account. A second factor is, of course, I'm talking about monetary policy being constrained, and here I'm talking about conventional monetary policy, so I'm talking about interest rate policies. But of course, in the environment we're talking about here, and what we have seen, is that the central bank increasingly starts to deploy unconventional monetary policy tools, and in particular using the balance sheet. And I can show you this here just as an illustration in the next chart, and this is basically across advanced economies, we have seen this gradually, with Japan naturally standing out. But of course, this, this use of the balance sheet brings about more complex interactions between fiscal and monetary policy. There can be a risk of fiscal costs and also more distributional impacts of monetary policy. And of course, the recent literature developments in the HANG models very much goes into that direction of, of, of looking at these more complex interactions. And in that sense, that literature has really been an enrichment for the debate on monetary fiscal policy interaction. But of course, these, these complexities I mentioned bring risks for the central bank, for instance, in terms of credibility in case you would run balance sheet losses. At the same time, of course, central banks are not passive in this. And, and of course, for instance, in the euro system, we have seen as 
as the balance sheet size has increased, we have also taken a commitment and concomitment uh, financial buffers uh, to protect ourselves to that. Then, of course, a final point, I mean, from the euro area perspective, um, as I represent here, the, um, I work for the ECB. The challenges, of course, that we mentioned again, when we talk about a monetary union case, of course, become more complex, especially when we also talk about these balance sheet policies. Now, that brings me to the final point in, in, in the talk here and, and um, brings me also to the question or the title of the, the workshop, and that is lifting R star, right? So, so far, what I have been discussing is a case where we take the R star environment as given and they talk about how monetary and policy, monetary and fiscal policy best interact, in particular, given the low inflation environment that, that we are faced with. But of course, as I had already shown you, there is some indigeneity, especially from the fiscal policy side. So fiscal policy can also help to lift our star. So, for instance, in the Euro system, we have done work and looked, for instance, at the role of pension reforms. And of course, well-designed pension reforms could reduce the need for precautionary savings. For instance, some colleagues of mine have looked at that and they find um, that um, an increase in the retirement age tends to decrease precautionary savings, for instance, thereby increased our star. However, for instance, a badly designed uh, um, fiscal um, pension reform, of course, could have opposite effects. And they find, for instance, that the increase in the contribution rate or the uh, reduced reduction of the benefit ratio at an unchanged retirement age would actually reduce our star. So, of course, these um, policies is easier said, but the devil is sometimes in the detail. A second factor, of course, besides uh, pension reforms is thinking of more growth friendly fiscal expenditures. You can have the same mass of fiscal expenditure, but if it's more growth friendly, that could, of course, also raise productivity and raise our star. And a final point that has already been touched upon in the workshop as well is, of course, um, they're addressing the safe asset scarcity. Of course, here we can have a discussion on how to do best do that, but it would, of course, also require reforms at the EMU level. I will not go into that because I have only 15 minutes here to talk, but you know that could be a workshop almost on its own. However, I want to close by noting that, as I had shown earlier, in terms of the drivers of the decline in our star, many of them are slow moving and hardwired and structural. And so when we talk about fiscal policy, I mean, we should also not being, uh, we should be a bit guarded in our expectations of how much fiscal policy can actually do in alone lifting our star. It can contribute, but it would not be a, a game changer. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, very insightful presentation uh, and also uh, nicely on time. Um, of course, if you have an event like this on our star, uh, then if you have to uh, discuss uh, the experience of uh, Japan. Um, I think no other country uh, has th the same experience as Japan uh, when it comes to uh, having a period of very low uh, inflation um, and very expansionary monetary policy, as we've just seen in the in the slide of Isabel. So I'm very happy uh, that the final speaker uh, will talk about Japan. Uh, Hiroshi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks to the SURF uh, organizer for uh, inviting me to this valuable workshop. Today, the, I'd like to explain how the effect of Japan's monetary policy can be assessed by looking at R star minus R and to show the necessity of raising R star for Japan and for the monetary policy to become more effective. And he, after that, if I have, I have a time, I will uh, touch upon the how to raise R star a bit, but uh, I, can, I may not be able to. So before, uh, but before that, I would first like to let you know why I think we should look at R star for monetary policy. This should bring up the old question of which is more effective channel, the interest rate or money for economic growth and inflation. And uh, history clearly tells us that the interest rate is the more uh, effective channel. This is important. And if we accept this, then R star minus R, R should be effective as the guidepost to check the degree of uh, monetary easing and tightening. And unconventional monetary policies like quantitative easing and yield curve control cannot be measured by one real rate. So we should use expanded method like checking both the short, uh, short and long term real rates or the real shadow rate in comparison with R star. But this doesn't change the basic idea of the framework. Though, of course, the uh, money 
credit or a more refined financial cycle index uh, suggests the sign of boom and bust of the, the financial side. So uh, the central bank should also watch them separately. And another point is whether monetary policy itself affects the natural uh, interest rate R star. If so, this might distort R star. My view for this is this point is that the uh, central bank uh, should still monitor R star, um, R star minus R through uh, take this factor into account, such as incorporating, for example, for, for the guidance shock and effectively lower bound for monetary policy resetting of the, the estimated models, like today's R stars, which, I, which Japanese researchers estimated. And uh, we may have other methods for this purpose as well. And uh, lastly, we should admit that there are large estimation errors for our star, which requires more Im improvement in the estimation. And we should review various estimates to see the actual trend. Next slide, please. Uh, keeping these points in mind, the, uh, let us look at Japan's monetary policy from the perspective of R star minus R. The left-hand side chart shows the long-run performance of the Japanese economy. After the bubble burst in 1991, economic growth has continued to decelerate, and CPI has continued to decelerate and reached 0% in 1995, when the yen appreciated sharply. Then, in the early 2000s, Japan slipped into deflation. Uh, since then, except for 2014, when the government raised the consumption tax and the yen depreciated sharply, CPI has continued to be at around zero. And looking at the R star and R in the right-hand side chart, uh, you can see that after the bubble burst, R was uh, in general slightly lower than R star, except for a few cases which support the Japanese economy, but may not have used enough to counteract the deflationary shocks of the 1990s. And after the BOJ lifted the zero rate policy in 2000, uh, Japan faced the bursting of uh, the global IT bubble. Then R was higher than R stars, which could not prevent Japan from going into deflation in early 2000. Then during the global financial crisis, R was again higher than R stars. Then the BOJ introduced the comprehensive easing policy and lowered the long-term government and corporate bond rates as well uh, through asset purchases. In 2013, the BOJ introduced the quantitative and qualitative easing but both cannot be measured by a simple comparison of R star and R anymore. Next slide, please. Now, uh, let us look at the financial condition during the QQE quantitative and qualitative easing era, starting from 2013. The BOJ committed to doing whatever it took to achieve the 2% inflation target in two years, and actually eased further in 2014 but could not respond so aggressively to inflation disappointment as it faced the effect of lower bound constraints. And in 2016, the BOJ adopted the negative interest rate policy and then shifted to, uh, from the, the QQE to yield curve control by targeting both overnight policy rate at minus 0.1% and the 10-year government uh, bond yield at 0% to secure the sustainability of the easing. And for these years, please see the inflation expectations on the uh, left hand side. The Japan's inflation expectations have long uh, been near zero, except for late uh, 2013 to early 2015, which I will explain later. And, but overall, they didn't rise much once they had been already at a low level and have a back, strong backward looking nature. As a result, the real 10-year yield on the right-hand side has been only slightly negative and not much below the low real return on capital, which suggests a limited stimulus effect. Next slide, please. And only late uh, 2013 to early 2015 was ex exceptional in that the inflation expectation rose temporarily. In addition to a uh, rise in the consumption tax rate hike, the major cause was the impact of QQE on uh, foreign exchange market, a remarkable constant contrast with bonds. Looking at the impact of the QQE on the bond yields and the uh, dollar yen rate when the BOJ announced the easing, uh, which I estimated using the Christian Mercy and Vincent Jorgensen method. And the result clearly shows that its impact on the yield were quite limited, 
while its impact of the drying rate was large, which was very different from the past comprehensive easing. As a result, and we saw a sharp depreciation of the yen from 2013 to early 15, overshooting what the real yield differential between the US and Japan suggested, thereby raising inflation expectations somewhat in a transitory way. However, this didn't persist. This is because such a reaction by FX market reflected the foreign investors' optimistic views about the QQE, while the domestic investor didn't have such a view. And this was backed by the fact that if we only look at the dollar yen movement during the time when the Tokyo market was open, we don't see the yen's depreciation for these three years. But that if only we only look at the uh, the time when Tokyo market was closed and foreign markets were open, we see large depreciation. This was caused by asymmetric information between domestic and foreign investors. But as this asymmetry now disappears, it implies that now such impact fades. Next slide, please. So let me summarize the impact of the QQE and the income control on the Japanese economy. The uh, left-hand side chart the table shows the Fisher equation in which the nominal long-term rates can be decomposed into the real long-term rate and long-term inflation expectations. The BOJ is a recent uh, the uh, the you know the uh, the BOJ's intention was to raise the inflation expectations to 2% level and lower the real rate to minus 2% to stimulate the economy. But actually, inflation expectations have turned positive but have not risen much. And thus, the real rate has not declined much. This is quite a contrast with the US. You can see the table. And because the US, the, in the US, the Fed's zero rate policy, along with the average inflation target, succeeded in maintaining the inflation expectation at over 2%, thereby decreasing the real rate to minus 1%. When this policy change is recognized as a decisive and limited term action, the people tend not to store money and tend to invest more without lowering inflation expectation. Now, please take a look at the comparison of R and R star in Japan in the right hand side chart. Uh, R star has gradually decreased uh, while except for the late uh, hard gradually, while except for late 2013 to early 2015, the uh, the BOJ has had trouble lowering the real overnight rate and the real 10 year yield, while the R star or uh, Japan's potential growth rate as a proxy of R star in the long run gradually has declined, and the stimulus effect of the monetary policy has not been large. If the BOJ lowers policy rate sharply, uh, it could stimulate the economy, but we think the effect of lower bound constrains its ability to raise inflation. The existence of the reversal interest rate, which the rate that, uh, which is the uh, the rate at which lowering their policy rate further becomes constructionary, and I estimated at around minus 0.5 percent, and of the likelihood threshold for depositors shifting from deposit to cash which we estimate minus 0.5 to minus 1% range, the, uh, they limit the size of possible further rate cut. Then the next question is whether the continuation of the this low or ultra long yield policy, which I named because uh, BOJ has continued an almost zero rate policy for more than 20 years, and this likely will continue more. So uh, this policy would prompt a rapid economic recovery and raise the inflation to 2%. And whether that happens or not, the first of all, uh, the first round the impact of monetary easing and shifting demand from the future to the present likely uh, has been exhausted over the past 20 years. And furthermore, the current R star minus R would not be enough. And if the potential growth rate declines further and negative shocks come, then the R star likely will also decline further. And if this materializes, it will reduce the easing effect of monetary policy and tightening financial conditions and lowering inflation expectations. Next slide, please. And therefore, uh, the, it is hard for, uh, to stimulate the economy and raise the inflation to percent from the current financial conditions unless R star rises. To think about this, I'd like to draw a big picture about the long-term trend of R star. 
And one of the major drivers of decline in our star is the decline of the in the population, uh, potential population growth rate. As this is not ma my main theme uh, today, I'd like to just uh, briefly cover the facts. For Japan, uh, the research is Sudan Takizuka estimated our star by using the overlapping generation model. The working age population continues to decline, reflecting the decline in the fertility rate and population aging combined with an increase in the longevity. And recently, the decline in the working age population has slowed because all the baby boomers have retired. But uh, and when the growth of the working age population slows significantly or the working age population shrinks, it leads to lower labor inputs and relatively higher capital accumulation. That's our excess savings, which in turn uh, lowers our star. And please look at the uh, right hand side chart from now to 2030. We expect the decline of working age population. Well, the same rate, their baby boomers will reduce their savings, and the average life expectancy will start to plateau. And based on these projections, we expect the decline in our start to decelerate, but nonetheless, not to recover. So our stock cannot rise unless other factors have forced to be fed. And Japan's farms have now a low growth expectations for Japan's domestic markets and hold large amount of savings without using them for effective spending. So the mobilization of such excess corporate savings for investment would have a strong impact on the economy in our view. Next slide, please. And here we briefly look at the potential options from this perspective, but I'm not going into deeper. The first one is that we large scale fiscal spending and raise our, our star. Conceptually, it might be yes, but please note that during the early 2000s, when the uh, Japanese government massively increased the public investment with, uh, whenever Japan faces a recession, faced a recession, we saw declines in labor productivity growth. And different from other countries where the infrastructure may not be sufficient enough, in Japan, a simple repeat of an, uh, the increase in public work spending uh, may not contribute to at least raise productivity growth. And quite recently, uh, the right-hand side chart shows that since the start of the outbreak of the pandemic, consolidated government debt it has increased significantly. However, this expansion effect may be transitory and the end when this policy stopped. So, the solution will be to raise Japan's growth expectations. And if firms expect the domestic economy to expand and households expect a future increase in their income, unlike in the past 30 years, they would increase their spending by reducing their savings. And the firms will be more aggressively uh, in changing their prices. As a result, if our star mines are right, this monetary easing also will be more effective. The current administration is now seeking structural reforms in terms of green growth promoting the, the uh, digital transformation to private firms and promoting restructuring private, private firms through investment and the weak form of, of investment in human resource for this reason. And uh, I will not go into details, but uh, I think, and, and also the BOJ decided to introduce new fund provisioning measures to address climate change and support such reforms from the fund allocation side. We think the government's act and the BOJ's efforts are moving in the right direction. However, the current measure that have been adopted or are in the planning stage is likely will not be enough to raise growth uh, expectations. And so we think the government needs to flesh out the specifics of uh, those strategies and also the attack of the more aggressively. And the, even the BOJ uh, is desirable in my view to broaden this perspective beyond the climate change areas uh, from the fund allocation side. And we think more aggressive efforts to uh, are needed in the labor market. Uh, in the labor market. So, uh, please, uh, next slide, please. So here are the uh, the five con uh, five conclusions which I explained today. I will not repeat that, but uh, let me stop here. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hiroshi. Um... I think your one of your conclusions at least uh, differs uh, quite substantially from uh, uh, one of the uh, arguments made by uh, Claudio. So that gives uh, hopefully some uh, uh, some nice discussion. Um, we agreed that uh, we're going to take a few more minutes uh, so that we have 
uh, sufficient time, well, at least some time uh, for Q&A. Um, I already received very, one very interesting uh, question. Um, let me see whether I can get it back. Uh, a question uh, asked by uh, Rolf, uh, Rolf Strauch, um, and is directed towards uh, Claudio. And I think it's a, it's a very relevant question because he argues that the most provocative argument uh, that you made, Claudio, is of course that monetary policy should accept medium term undershooting of inflation. Um, and that of course uh, could imply that there is an asymmetric monetary policy reaction function. Um, and uh, that's uh, of course, uh, uh, um, that of course begs the question how, how to do that, how to introduce uh, uh, this, uh, especially in the current environment uh, where we need a strong recovery. Is it really now the time to start such a change in policy regime? Uh, he's asking. Um, so a related question uh, comes from Ernest, uh, Ernest Kahn, uh, and he asked, okay, if you have consistent undershooting and if you accept that, uh, what will then happen with inflation expectations? Don't you run the risk that these inflation expectations will get unanchored? Um, I think these are very nice questions to uh, start the discussion with. So, uh, Claudio, I, I give you the floor. Uh, please, uh, if possible, reply as concise as possible. <laughs> as concise as possible. Okay. As possible. Uh, well, first of all, uh, by the way, uh, hi, Rolf. I, I can't see you, but uh, I can read you. It's, uh, it's good to see your question. These are obviously very pertinent questions, is the questions that I, even I ask uh, myself. So let me try and uh, distinguish a few things. Actually, there is nothing in my in my analysis that says, particularly also the anal empirical analysis that I discussed uh, before about the behavior of inflation at low levels that uh, rules out any overshooting uh, for the same reasons as uh, undershooting should not be a problem when it comes to uh, inflation uh, becoming unanchored, inflation becoming unanchored, the same would also apply to overshooting. Of course, let me stress all else equal. Uh, the reason why my, my presentation uh, has focused on the asymmetric part is because of the starting conditions and what we have been saying so far is the fact that we don't have, uh, well, the room for policy maneuver has clearly fallen and that there is a, uh, uh, it's important to try and regain it, uh, of course. Now, if something is valuable, then there, there is going to be a, a bit of a price to, to pay for it. And, uh, and this is something that uh, one should bear in mind. If it has an option value, then uh, it is something worth uh, going for. But nothing, and let me stress, I cannot, I don't know how I can stress it emphatically enough. Nothing of what I said as, uh, says about what is right and what is wrong about what one should be doing now. I am providing a framework to uh, uh, help you think through the issues. And then, of course, when central banks decide or a particular central bank decides to embark along these lines, if it decides to embark along these lines, well, this is something that it is up to the central banks to decide based on the circumstances that they face. And those circumstances vary a lot um, across countries and across time. Now, the, the other thing, which is indeed true, I mean, let's assume that you accepted uh, the arguments. Uh, would it be easy to move and to change? No, I think it would be very, very hard. Um, partly because we know financial markets have become a rather dependent on monetary policy. So they're very sensitive to, to changes in uh, the policy stance. And of course, because debt levels, as I argued before, have increased over time. So it would not be easy. Uh, but you can take these these signals as indeed suggesting the risks of some kind of time inconsistency in um, in the policies. Um, so no, definitely it would not be easy, and it would require a lot of communication in terms of justifying the policy, explaining uh, 
if you buy the story, the, the arguments that I suggested, communication about the pace, and may indeed, in some cases, even require some changes of agreements with the with the government. Uh, now, the the unanchored, the issue of uh, expectations, inflation expectations becoming unanchored. This is indeed, uh, Ernest, it's, it's a very pertinent question. My answer would be, if you like, multifaceted. Um, first of all, uh, let's look at the experience of uh, in Japan, uh, which was described before. Now, you can look at that experience, you can read it in two different ways. You can basically say, well, unless the central bank had actually tried as hard as it has, unless it had done that, then expectations would simply have uh, uh, got into a spiral, uh, which is, I think, some of the concerns that one could express. Another way of interpreting it, and it's, I, I admit that it's difficult to sort things out, would be to say, well, given that monetary policy has had uh, relatively little traction, despite trying very, very hard, it's not obvious that uh, inflation expectations would have been very different from what they are now. Then if I look at history, if I look at history, it's very, very hard to find episodes in which uh, this uh, has been the case. Um, and the the arguments that I provided before about the forces of inflation remaining range bound are, are suggestive that this may not be a, as high a risk as, as people uh, suggest. And um, finally, remember if um, it would also matter less, I mean, would it be important if you see that somehow your measures of expectations are about 1% as opposed to being 2%? Well, is that a big problem? If you take the argument that inflation is likely to be range bound, that would not be necessarily a big issue. So you can, one idea is to say, well, I can sort of live with that unless inflation really gets out of control in one, in one direction or, or the other. Moreover, I think one, one has to make a distinction between financial market expectations, which are very sensitive, and expectations of uh, workers, firms, that are those that really matter for the inflation process. And there the evidence is, is, is rather different. It's not clear that they are particularly responsive. I would even say to the inflation rate. I would suggest that, or if they are, because the inflation rate is a, a rather uh, range bound, then at the end of the day, it need not make that big a difference. Remember Greenstone's definition of price stability. <laughs> I think that we should okay. go back to that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's a very uh, interesting thought. Um, I always uh, thought of uh, Greenspan as uh, someone who was mumbling with great coher incoherence. Um, so now you're suggesting let's go back to him. Uh, but I, I agree that there is uh, that this is is a theoretically very attractive uh, uh, notion of price stability. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Claudio, and all the other participants in this part of the program. Uh, it's highly appreciated. Uh, I think we had a very nice uh, exchange of views uh, and interesting uh, thought-provoking ideas.